Hmm. But there are numerous vegan vitamins that have it. So that's one solution. Another is just to make sure you eat plenty of, of hot vegetables, high in vitamin A, so that you are, are making sure you're getting extra. Uh, gotcha. If you have problems with night vision, say you are running into doors at night or something like that where it doesn't seem like you see well at night, especially compared to what you used to see, then that could possibly be a vitamin A deficiency. Uh, also, um, poor wound healing is another one. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's a few other symptoms. If you're not having any symptoms of vitamin A deficiency, then I really wouldn't worry about it. Uh, okay. And the, the keto dieters, I mean, they're not not being vegan because of that. It doesn't. They don't. It's they're just people are just throwing out arguments for their side. So mm-hmm. yeah, you're going to read all kinds of stuff from keto people. That <laughs> all right. You shouldn't get too worried about. Fantastic. And then, um, Alex, what, what can you recommend for us? What's a great meal or food item or what do you go for when you're looking to get enough vitamin A? So, you know, orange veggies, of course, and it depends. Some of you, I'm sure, listening are really good cooks and you spend hours in the kitchen and others probably hate cooking. Yeah, that's uh, me. Jack, so. <laughs> Jack, yeah. Jack and I are very different in that way. So Jack will have carrot juice. I mean, that's a quick, easy fix. I hate juice, and I really hate carrot juice, but it's quick and easy. Um, So for me, I love uh, butternut squash, and I roast it. I take the whole squash. You don't peel it. You don't cut it, nothing. You just put it in the oven like it's a potato. You roast it 350 degrees, about half an hour. It depends how big it is um, until you poke a knife in. And then it's, you don't have to, you know, when you have a a raw squash and it's really hard to peel and you're cutting yourself. So you don't have to do it. Once you take it out, the flesh just kind of falls off. The skin falls off and it's Mm. all tender. And then, uh, you know, I'll use that in stir fries or you can puree it for soup. Um, Ooh, butternut squash soup would be good right now. (laughs) Yeah, it's so easy. And so if you don't like carrot juice and you don't like to cook, then the last option would be just a frozen bag of sweet potato fries. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Um, all right, to the next uh, question. Oh, you got something else for that? Paige, can I say, I just posted a link to vitamin A in the info section. Ah, right. And yes. there's so, a few paragraphs on that question you asked on that in that article. Did it awesome. show up? Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, yeah, everyone uh, in the info channel, that's where uh, they're going to be posting their links. Um, so if you check that out, um, that's what he's talking about. All right. So next question is, um, <laughs> uh, if I'm not mistaken, people, especially on the carnivore diet, keep mentioning how plant foods contain oxalate and therefore are bad. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, most plant foods don't contain enough oxalate to matter. Uh, there are some plant foods that have very high amounts, such as spinach. And so uh, oxalate can lead to kidney stones if you eat too much of it. Hmm. Um, in, in the anecdotally for vegans that have had kidney stones that I've talked to that have asked for advice, usually once they start, once they cut out the massive, sorry, the foods that have a massive amount of oxalate, like especially spinach and, um, and start increasing their liquid, the kidney stones generally have not come back. In fact, I'm not aware of any cases where they have had multiple cases, so it's it's extremely rare. It's probably not worth worrying about. There is a whole community uh, based around oxalate that think that they mm-hmm. are high oxalate absorbers and that they have all sorts of problems due to oxalate, and they try to avoid every food that has the slightest bit of oxalate. That remains to be seen. I you know it hasn't been well studied. It to the extent that it has. There's a, there's a lot of skepticism about it um, in mainstream medicine, and there just hasn't been enough research to really know one way or the other. Um, but very rare, and so it's not worth worrying about unless for some reason you feel like you might be one of these people that have a very high oxalate absorption rate. There are ways to combat it as well as not just avoiding food, but also... Um, Taking calcium supplements because calcium binds oxalate in the digestive tract and you excrete it that way. Mm-hmm. But don't 
you know, don't start going out taking calcium because of that. You should talk to a doctor first if you think you're a high oxalate absorber for some reason. Okay. And there's a whole long article on veganhealth.org about this issue about oxalate. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're interested, you can find a lot of info there. Perfect. All right. Um, Next question is... um, so it's something that people say a lot. Um, a lot of people say it like from the Adventist Health Study. It's do vegans actually live longer? And additionally, um, I'm sure you've heard um, with the Epic Oxford Study, people have been um, saying that vegans have a higher risk of stroke than non-vegans. And if this is true, is it worth the risk to vegan? Or is it a risk at all? So let me post something um, in the info. Mm-hmm. Can I, put, can I post an image? Yes, I can, it looks like. This is a list of the large cohorts that have included um, large amounts of vegetarians and vegans to date. And if you look in the SMR column, which stands for Standardized Mortality Ratio, mm-hmm. you see what the average mortality rate is compared to the, to the uh, surrounding population. And it's about half... Uh, compared to the normal population. So when we're studying the vegetarians and vegans in these studies, we're talking about people that are very long-lived on average, whether they're vegetarian and vegan or meat eaters within these populations. So the question is, do do vegetarians and vegans live longer than other people among healthy populations or compared to the average person? I think we have enough research to indicate that compared to the average American or UK resident, vegetarians and vegans uh, live longer. But we don't have a way, we have not, there have not been enough vegan deaths in these studies to determine if vegans live a different, have a different lifespan than other healthy, than other people in these healthy populations. Um, And to, um, so far, vegans don't seem to have a difference, but there haven't been enough studies. Okay. Lacto vegetarians actually seem to have a slightly lower risk of early death, and I should say th- these are usually measured as deaths up to the age of ninety. And once you're ninety and above, they don't they no longer include you in in, oh, the, in the data. So it's it's risk of early death, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, and so, did you? Um, yeah. So that's what's that? Sorry. Sorry. Continue. Well, in terms of stroke, if you get, let me post another link because the stroke is pretty complicated and mm-hmm. not in a way that, I mean, the, the answer is not complicated. Let me make sure I got that right. Yeah. So there's been a, a number of research papers that have come out looking at vegetarians and stroke in the last couple of years. And mm-hmm. for the most part, they don't, they do not show a higher risk of stroke among vegetarians that, that includes some small percentage of vegans. There have not been enough vegans studied to really separate them out regarding stroke. So, uh, however, um, even in the cases where there's been a slightly increased risk of stroke among vegetarians in a certain population, the overall impact of a lower risk of cardiovascular disease in general has overcome any increased risk of stroke. Okay, so sort of the biggest concern I have about the biggest concern I have about vegans and stroke is that people with very low cholesterol levels tend to have higher risks of hemorrhagic stroke. Now this could be you also tend to need to have high blood pressure, but and vegans tend to have lower blood pressure than non vegans. So that could Mm -hmm. counteract the low cholesterol levels. Overall, it's better to have the low cholesterol levels, um, but it is something to be concerned about, especially for people who might be at a high risk of stroke for genetic reasons. Um, mm-hmm. But oh, f- for your average person, it's uh, you're going to have a benefit in terms of cardiovascular disease as long as you're taking enough B12. Uh, so that's what mm-hmm. I would where I would fall on the subject. All right. Thanks so much. Perfect. So now, um, question for Alex. Um, the big tofu question. So, what are the differences between silken, firm, and extra firm tofu? 
and how we cook it, and what are the best usages for each of those types. So, Stokin is usually the Mori New brand, not always, but it's in the aseptic container. Sometimes stores have it in the refrigerated section, but usually it's not, and it doesn't need to be refrigerated until it's open. Um, and those tofus are really good to puree and make a salad dressing or even a chocolate mousse dessert. Oh. And, yeah, put it in a smoothie if you need extra protein. It's a great way. You know, it has a wonderful creamy mouthfeel. But a lot of new vegans will buy silken tofu and then cube it or dice it and try to saute it or grill mm. it, and it just crumbles and falls apart. And so then they're disappointed in tofu. So they're two very different uses. So if you want to cube it or something, you want to get the fresh water-packed tofu. And so it will always be in the refrigerated section. And I just get the extra firm. I never buy medium or firm. I just get the firmest one I can find. Um, mm. If you can't get an extra firm, you just need to cook it a little bit longer and you just get rid of some of the moisture and it'll get chewier if you want it chewy. And then it's really easy to, you know, put on skewers on the grill or saute slices. And, you know, think of it like chicken. You would not just boil a chicken breast and eat it like that with nothing on it. And so tofu is the same. You know, when you eat chicken, it's all about the sauce and the spices. And so with tofu... Yeah, it, fat matters. You know, if you want to saute it or roast it uh, with a little bit of fat, that always adds more flavor. And when you caramelize it, but then you want to do a, you know, barbecue sauce, a tomato sauce, hot peppers, um, tamari, ginger, miso for the umami. So a lot of people, again, they, they will try tofu for the first time and they won't season it or won't season it very well. And then they'll think, oh, tofu is gross. I can't eat it. Mm -hmm. But they never would have eaten a chicken breast that, you know, that bland. So just... A, a, a recipe that you already make with chicken, try it with tofu and don't cut back on the seasonings. Awesome. Yeah, and with silken tofu, what I usually use it for, I'm a big fan of like soups. Like I like tom yum yeah. soup or like a hot and sour soup. Huge yeah. fan of that. Had never thought to use it in a dessert. Can you kind of walk me through what like a tofu mousse would be like? Yeah, well, the first thing is if you're feeding non-vegans, you don't want to tell them that they're eating tofu dessert. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Of course. Until after but it's so good. It's one of the very first things I started to make, you know, a million years ago. <laughs> and it's just smoked and tofu. Um, I make it with melted chocolate chips and then a little sugar, maple syrup or vanilla or even cinnamon if you want different spices. Um, some recipes call for cocoa powder instead. And that's easier because then you don't have to melt the chocolate and worry about it, you know, seizing. But um, if you do the melted chocolate, it has a, a slightly richer taste. But it's, mm -hmm. it comes out, it just, it tastes like a heavy cream-based chocolate mousse. It is delicious and, and very rich and very creamy. Um, and you don't, it does not taste like tofu. It tastes like chocolate. Awesome. I got to try that. Yeah. All together. right. So next question. Um, so... Uh, we're just going to uh, take a quick step back um, to Jack's question. Someone's asking, so they, primarily, Mr. North, were talking about a healthy population. And what definition are you using of, like, a healthy population? I think this is in reference to something you're talking about with the uh, studies from before. Yes, yeah, so uh, feel free to call me Jack for one thing. And also, if you look at what I posted in the info, what I simply mean is compared to the average national averages of the UK and the United States, if you're in a population that on average has a much lower rate of early death, then you're by definition in a healthy population. Now, some characteristics of those populations would tend to be, uh, generally, they don't eat as much meat as the average person does. They smoke less. They drink less alcohol. Those are probably the big three. They can exercise a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's basically it. Uh, that, you know, there might be other things that may not be part of every population, but that benefit some of these populations. Awesome. That would be, Thanks yeah. so much. And so now talking about tofu, um, we got to consider the big question, the big estrogen question. So mm -hmm. if the estrogen in soy could affect us, how much would I have to eat to make a difference? It's not really clear, uh, as always. Uh, 
It, it seems there's been enough research to say that three servings a day of soy is safe. Now, that doesn't seem like very many if you're a vegan who eats soy many times a day. But there's no evidence that, say, five servings isn't safe. And the people that have had the anecdotal reports of people that have had problems have been eating uh, in excess of 10 servings a day. And, and these are just a, a few people out of Ten millions. So it's possible that if you were to eat nothing but soy for days on end, you could find an effect. But uh, so don't do that. I wouldn't recommend it uh, unless you want to do an experiment. But for mm -hmm. most people, there's nothing to worry about. Just don't eat it for every single meal and uh, you should be fine. Yeah, I just so, checked. And there's I, also uh, benefits from soy. They actually, re, it re, there's a, re, a reduction in breast cancer risk for soy. So for women, it can be a benefit to eat two to three servings a day. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I just checked my block of tofu, and it said there's four servings in a block. So that'd be ten servings of eating over two blocks of tofu a day. Uh, that seems a little excessive. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, all right. when you figure in the, the soy milk and the vegan meats and stuff, you have to take into account that as well. Okay. Um, but, yeah. Well, I fantastic. definitely agree with you. It's a lot of soy to eat 10 servings a day. Gotcha. And then, um, so I'm going to pivot real quick to my favorite vegan protein <laughs> that is not soy, which is seitan. Huge fan. <laughs> um, so, Alex, yeah. what can you tell us about seitan? And then followed by Jack, what can you tell us about the health of seitan? I think it's almost a perfect food. Um, two, two things to think about first. One, if you have celiac disease and you can't have gluten, it is gluten. It's all gluten. <laughs> so, sorry in advance for that. And two, just buy it. Now, again, those of you that Love cooking. There's a lot of recipes for homemade seitan. It's fun to make, and then you can really change the spices. But it's a little labor intensive because what you do is you're taking wheat flour, and then you're you're getting rid of the extra chaff in it, and so it's just the protein. So it's very high in protein. It's chewy gluten. It's almost like uh, gnocchi, but chewier. So, so it's a great, great source of protein, and it's it picks up wonderful flavors like whether it's a ginger miso sauce or a barbecue sauce, it's like the tofu. Um, and a lot of people prefer it over tofu because one, they're, they might be trying to cut back on how much soy they eat. And two, it just has a, um, almost a richer flavor. Um, mm -hmm. So it's good. You, and you can get it pre-made and either basic season, you know, just a little tiny bit of salt, nothing else, or all sorts of fun marinades and stuff. And you don't have to cook it. You can just slice it up and throw it in a salad or a stir, a stir fry or a stew. But you can also, um, it's really good sauteed. It's really good braised in like a red wine, almost like a, a bourguignon, using it instead of beef. Mm. So, yeah, it picks up flavors really good, and it just gets um, a better texture the longer it goes. Highly recommend trying it. It's, yeah, great. Peanut wraps are my favorite thing. And then my girlfriend also makes a seitan steak sort of thing with some, like, rosemary and a lemon thyme sauce. It's Yum. phenomenal. Love it. Yeah. And then, so, Jack, where are we looking on the health aspect mm -hmm. of seitan? Well, one positive is that it's very high in protein, and there aren't that many vegan foods that are real high in protein. So, if you, especially if you tend to be someone who craves protein and feels better when you're eating a lot, then yeah, that's then me. Seitan's a, <laughs> a very convenient, and I'm like that too. So, seitan's a pretty convenient food. Awesome. There are people, as Alex mentioned, with celiac disease who are extremely sensitive. It's an autoimmune disease, and they need to avoid all gluten. And mm -hmm. so, they definitely couldn't take, eat, eat, eat seitan. And then there's also uh, another group of people. There's two other groups of people. One group is people that think they have a gluten sensitivity but really don't. And there's a group of people that have a gluten sensitivity and they mm -hmm. do, and that, but, but not celiac disease. So mm -hmm. the people um, with gluten sensitivities or who suspect it might want to experiment with not eating any, anything with gluten for a while and then adding it back slowly and seeing if it makes a difference to their health. Research has shown that, that uh, most people who think they have a gluten sensitivity on 
uh, a appropriate plan challenges withdrawal and challenges don't actually have a gluten sensitivity. So um, interesting. Sometimes I think people want to be allergic to vegan food so that they don't <laughs> have to go vegan because they feel like maybe they should, and that's a good good reason not to. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone who really wants to go vegan, but you think you've got a gluten sensitivity limiting the food you can eat, then the good news is there's a good chance you don't. In fact, on average, you probably don't have a gluten sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, but it's good to talk to a health professional uh, about how to do a proper challenge to determine if you uh, really have one or not. Awesome. Thanks for the fact, you just uh, You just led me to another issue that we I like to mm -hmm. say something about I mean, um, vegan, vegan. Oh, uh, Jack, and you're cutting out a little bit. Allergies. Huh? Sorry, could you? That food allergies. Sorry. Uh, you're cutting out a little bit. Are you hearing that as well, Alex? Oh, I am. Yeah, it just started about 30 seconds, Jack. So wherever you just move to, stop. Uh, and then... Let me see. That sounds good. I was saying that... The... Okay. Sorry to say that there was something else I wanted to talk about regarding vegans and anti-vegans. Mm -hmm. Am I coming through now? Yes. yes. Yes, you're coming through now. Oh, great. And that is allergies. Mm -hmm. And uh, what people should know about food allergies is that to, there's a lot of alternative partners use what's called body to determine food you're allergies. Uh -oh. you're, yeah, we're breaking up. Yeah, we're all right, something's wrong with the connection. Um, uh, I think sorry, I might you be an internet move issue. on to a <laughs> Is it, But I don't know if it's my internet or your uh, um, internet. So let me just reconnect. All right, yeah, that, that'd be great. Um, we, we, we can, can talk about that. food. <laughs> yeah, we got a question in the meantime. Coming off the Satan one, I kind of asked about this, but then we got... Someone asked in chat now about it. Are there any general tips for people that want a meaty taste in their food without actually consuming meat? And that ties in with the, uh, here, just, you got it. Have the floor. Talk about umame. <laughs> yes, yes, umame. And I will share that link again um, now that I know how. So, yeah. yeah, again, when you, so when you think about meat, a lot of times it's just salt and fat. I mean, standard American diets, meat-heavy diets are full of salt and fat and sugar. And sometimes people will go vegan overnight and they'll right away switch to, you know, oil-free, really healthy food or a strict diet to go vegan. And so it's disappointing and your, your taste buds are mad and you won't stick with it and you won't stay vegan. So the first thing is just adding fat and salt to your food, um, especially at first. And then if you want to slowly transition into a lower salt, lower fat diet, you know, great, go for it. Um, and of course, just think about what you're used to eating. But then umami is, you know, possibly the fifth taste element, some people say, and it's found in foods like uh, cabbage, I'm sorry, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, tamari, sun-dried tomatoes, dried mushrooms, and it's an extra richness that's a little mm -hmm. hard to describe, but it makes a big difference. This is, I think, really helpful when you're giving up cheese sometimes because mm. um, you know so if you if you're making pizza and you normally you're vegetarian but you use cow cheese and you want to go vegan so there's a lot of good vegan cheeses so you can do that but some of them not everybody likes um so the first mm. thing you can do is just use um kalamata olives and or sun-dried tomatoes on the pizza and that's going to add some fat and that rich umami uh, mouthfeel so that's going to help replace the cheese and I'll, share, I'll put a link in the info, but you, mm -hmm. if you're not feeling satisfied on a vegan diet and you're thinking, oh, maybe I need to eat meat again, it could be that you just need to eat more seasoning and more umami seasoning. And so mm -hmm. try that for a week first. Yeah. Um, and off of that, uh, I don't know if Jack is back in business yet. I but think I'm back. Can you hear oh, me? There, yeah. yeah, you do sound better now. We'll see. We'll hope that lasts. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, recently... Uh, so basically, my mom, uh, I used to have headache, or, or chronic migraines when I was in high school, and my mom was convinced that it was MSG that was causing my migraines. So I basically hadn't had MSG for a long time, would like check with any like um, you know Asian restaurants I would go to or whatever. 
anyways, I don't think that was what was causing my migraines. Um, but I recently started trying MSG again to give that sort of umami. But it seems like a health stigma around that, right? I mean, I feel like my mom's sentiment comes uh, from somewhere. So I'm wondering what are the, or if there are any health implications of using MSG and maybe explain what MSG is to people who don't know. Do you want me to do that, Alex, or do you want to explain what it is? Oh, uh, yeah, I think you do it better on that one. <laughs> uh, monosodium glutamate, which is an amino acid that has a certain taste that uh, people like. And there does not seem to be any... Uh, the evidence that, mon that MSG is harmful uh, is... There was a lot of controversy around the original uh, research that suggested it was. And so I don't think that there's any reason to worry about MSG. Um, you know, it's, okay. it's, it's just an amino acid, which you get in your food all the time. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot to add, except I, I heard a really great podcast a couple of years ago about the whole story regarding MSG, which was fascinating. And I don't know it off the top of my head, but if anyone's real interested in it, if you Google it, you might be able to find this podcast. I'm sorry, I wish I had. I'll look for it while while. Uh, <laughs> gotcha, Alex gotcha. Yeah, someone. and then Alex, um, do you use MSG? You have any tips for using it? Maybe. Yeah. You know, I don't use it, but I'm not against it, and I never check for it if I go out to eat. Okay. Um, you know, it's one of those things because. And, and yeah, I think it was a big, you know, there's a lot of scare around it um, that was mostly based on false science or no science, I should say. So I just got used to not cooking with it when right. I was in my culinary career. So now I don't use it. But now I'm very comfortable. You know, I, I don't hesitate to eat it. And I'm just, I have that link with some of that nutrition. I'll find it and put it in the post if you want to ask. The next awesome. Time. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, all right. This next one. So... Uh, this will be for Jack. Are, are there any advances in vegan nutrition you're hoping to see as the movement grows bigger? Or what was the biggest advancement you've seen in your field? Well, I'd like to see the food supply fortified to to take care of vegan uh, nutritional needs. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's it's geared towards omnivore nutrition needs, and it would be great if it was geared more towards vegans. So... Uh, and I'm particularly concerned about B12 in countries where people don't have access to supplementation or fortified foods. Right. So uh, I, apparently there's there are efforts around the globe to fortify foods with B12. So um, hopefully, eventually, it will not be much of an issue. Yeah, that um, yeah. Uh, I would like to see clinical trials with omega-3s. To, to determine whether the vegans really do need to be taking omega-3s. And I could easily talk for an hour about that. I saw that there was a question about it, and since I'm touching on it now, I could just oh, yeah, uh, yeah. go ahead and answer it. Definitely. And that is that I do not think there's compelling evidence that vegans need to take DHA or EPA, which are the long-chain omega-3 fatty acids that are found in fish oil or also in algae oils. But so, and if I'm remembering question, it is some some people think that it's a very cautious thing to do to be on the safe side. I'm in the midst of researching uh, in more depth the questions surrounding omega threes, and I've been doing it now for almost a year, and I'm getting close to being able to publish something. What we have right now is is pretty good on veganhealth.org. If you click on the omega-3 link and go to the omega-3 research, it will summarize all the different issues with omega-3s and vegan diets pretty well to the extent that, that we know, uh, to, you know, it will give us a state of what we know. I'm trying to look more into, um, there's, so there's, a, well, I guess I shouldn't really get into it because I could go on for too long about it. But, if you um, are interested, veganhealth.org, we have a mailing list. At the bottom of every page on the site, there's a sign-up form, and you can sign up to get any updates we have. And we don't – it won't be a lot of email. It's maybe twice a month that we send out an update. 
And then once we do publish the final omega-3 uh, findings, you will be able to receive those if you sign up. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I, I um. We'll yeah, that that's um that's super interesting because yeah, I I do keep omega supplements around. I don't take them every day, but just when I like you know maybe I haven't had seaweed in a little bit, I eat a lot of seaweed. So, or like I haven't had like a protein shake where I put like flax and chia seeds and stuff in there. Um, but so do you think though that like we should be in our diets, um, like caring about omegas? Like I always, you know, put chia and flax seeds and or hearts or whatever in my yeah. smoothie. Should you, I, you should I definitely be eating, we should definitely be eating the alpha linolenic acid, which is mm -hmm. also called ALA and is what is found in chia and flax and walnuts, soy, canola oil, hemp oil. Those are the main, I think I, I covered the main ones. And so vegans should try to make sure they have a source of that on a daily basis. And I do it just by putting, them, you know, a sprinkling a few walnuts on my oatmeal each morning. Mm -hmm. And that covers it for the most part. I mean, you're getting omega-3s through all, uh, small amounts through vegetables and, like I said, soy. So... Yeah, definitely do that. But in terms of supplementing with EPA or DHA, that is probably not necessary. Uh, and I wouldn't. It, we don't recommend that people do it. We certainly say that if you're concerned about it that, and, and you have the ability to supplement, then by all means. But I, right now the evidence does not seem compelling that vegans need to supplement, in my opinion. All right. Awesome. Um, and so going back a step real quick, you were talking about um, uh, with advancements, you want to see, you know, like more B12 fortification around the world, especially in um, lower income countries where they don't have access to these supplements as much. So <clears throat> I was wondering, this is another, this is a point that a lot of like the paleo carnivore people will bring up. So is, is it possible to get an adequate amount of B12 um, and iron uh, on a vegan diet in nature. If not, does this indicate that veganism isn't the ideal diet for humans? You, I, I think it remains to be seen if, if humans could get enough B12 in a state of nature, say pre prehistorical times, or maybe even pre-industrial revolution times. I don't think we know. There's not enough evidence that to determine it, I'm skeptical that, that humans were able to get enough B12 without eating uh, mm -hmm. some level of animal products. Uh, it would indicate that a vegan diet that's not supplemented with B12 is unnatural, but if you supplement with B12, then you're fine. And so... You know, that's what I'd say about it. I, I don't think humans evolved as vegans. They're, they, humans evolved eating anything that they could eat, anything that they could digest. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently that uh, large numbers of people have decided that they want to move away from killing animals for food. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is dealing with, with vitamin B12. And luckily, it's not hard to deal with at all. It's inexpensive and you end up with better vitamin B12 status than omnivores if you just follow basic recommendations. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, if, if, if you're trying to eat like our prehistoric ancestors did, and I know a lot of Paleolithic people say they are or think they are, or maybe are. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> then, yeah, that's, that's, if that's what you, how you want to eat, then more, you know, more power to you, I guess. But if you want to eat a diet that doesn't contribute to animal suffering, then I don't think it's any bit, you know, not very few people are eating a natural diet in today's world. Paleolithic eaters might be trying to, but um, most people aren't doing that. And people who think that they're eating a natural diet are, are just don't understand how people used to eat, how humans used to eat. So, okay. um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. <clears throat> so, do you consider the dietary intake of vitamin D in the average non-vegan individual to be uh, insubstantial enough such that classifying it as a dietary vitamin loses strength in many cases? If so, do you think this has 
this has the potential to provide a false sense of security to people that vitamin D can be obtained without thought from diets, especially when excluding fish. Well, that's an interesting question. I, I think that before the food supply, especially milk, was fortified with vitamin D in the United States and in the industrial world, a lot of children were getting rickets because they, mm -hmm. they were vitamin D deficient. And once the fortification started, the rickets went away for the most part. So that is why vitamin D is considered a vitamin. And if the food supply wasn't, supply, wasn't fortified with vitamin D, uh, I think rickets would likely come back. So... Oh. I think it's a vitamin. I think that it's a legitimate use of the word vitamin. I mean, it's just a semantical thing. Mm -hmm. Whether um, your average person's going to get more vitamin D than, than a vegan who's not supplementing just due to getting small amounts and a lot of different sources. To meet the RDA, everyone would need to take supplements. For and vitamin D? interesting that not more for vitamin D. It's interesting that there's not more discussion about that uh, in society mm -hmm. because... Uh, the RDA is at 600 international units a day, and no one's getting that from their diet. So uh, it's a curious thing as to why there's not more talk about people needing to get more vitamin D and promoting supplements for vitamin D. But I definitely I take a vitamin D2 supplement on a daily basis um, mm -hmm. because of it. And I recommend, you know, vegan health recommendations are that people take vitamin D. Now, you can get vitamin D from the sun, but it's just safer to not expose yourself to a lot of mm -hmm. sun. And so some dermatologists, maybe all dermatologists, I don't know, the ones that talk about vitamin D, will recommend that you get it from supplements and not try to get it from the sun. They're, they're fairly cautious, cautious because mm -hmm. of skin cancer. Uh, so it's possible to get it from the sun, but you are probably smarter to get it from a supplement. Vitamin D2 supplements are very inexpensive. You can get a six-month supply for about, I don't know, $12 off Amazon, if I'm remembering right, something like that. Okay. So uh, I recommend that everyone do it. This is for meat eaters or, or vegans alike. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Um... So next question is for you, Alex. So when doing activism on Discord, we eventually reach a point where someone is convinced of the ethical obligations, but is not sure where to start with transitioning or what to cook. People will sometimes point to some of the less nutritious, less accessible foods like Impossible or Beyond, or bring up highly processed options like Oreos. What are your go-to recipes or techniques for showing people that are relatively nutritious uh, easy to prepare, affordable, and delicious using basic ingredients like beans that we can share with our vegan curious members here. A oh, good question. Um, so, f first of all, I, I have to backtrack a little bit. I would do impossible on Oreos. If it is, it, you know, depending okay. on what you're for. if I'm cooking for a meat eater who is healthy, because it's not like all meat eaters have terrible diets, right? If I'm cooking for someone who's healthy, then yes, I am going to make, um, my gosh, like a, a white bean and kale stew, or there's this amazing recipe for a French onion skillet lasagna. I'll post it in the info. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to need to see yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, just delicious. But if I'm cooking for someone that eats a lot of burgers that maybe eats fast food, I am absolutely going to first serve them something like an impossible burger, um, mm -hmm. Oreo cookie, something like that to help them get over that first fear of going vegan because if someone's kind of interested but their first vegan meal does not satisfy them i'm gonna lose them and they're not gonna go vegan um so yeah i don't worry about health at, at first i just want someone to help animals and to go vegan and then um yeah and then so i'll post the the skillet lasagna yeah that's then, sounds oh, like yeah it's amazing <laughs> and then i also have a great recipe for well it's not mine but um from Rainbow Plant Life for the best vegan brownies that I will mm. cook. So I'll do brownies. Quinoa is a really good um, food to use because it is mm. high in protein, so it's more satiating for someone that normally eats meat. Um, and then, 
you know, a lot of the company websites have some incredible and creative food ideas. So Tofurky sausages, just go to tofurky.com or Mori New for the silken tofu, mm-hmm. um, your favorite soy milk. Oh my gosh, I know. The Korean vegan right now. I am oh, all I love over her. her recipes. Oh my God, they're so good. I made some of her chocolate chip cookies with red bean paste a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Every single person I gave them to, they were not vegan, the people. And just people were raving about them, begging me for the recipe. Um, so I'll post that. Uh, chili, obviously, when you're talking about beans. Chili's uh, delicious. Lentil soup. I, lentils are pretty hard. Oh, yeah. To yeah, lentils are always satisfying to people. And even people that don't really like beans, they'll like lentils usually. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, a, yeah. I'm a big fan of Ethiopian food. <laughs> a lot yeah. of they, they oh, yeah. a lot of uh, lentils. Um, it, it, the way they use lentils is so amazing. Yes, that yes, Ethiopian food is is a great one for non vegan uh, non vegan supply. And Thai food is is fantastic. Thai food. Oh, I love Thai. Thai is my favorite food, <laughs> and I love yeah. tom yum soup. Oh. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Indian food is great. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, and what am I thinking? Just basic beans and rice, salsa, and guacamole. You know, a burrito, a bowl, That's not. A meal, yeah. yeah, just vegan Mexican food. It c- tends to be very satisfying to anyone, no matter what their normal diet is. Uh-huh. Awesome. And yeah, really, it really depends. There's not one answer because there's a million different ways to be vegan, just like there's a million different ways to eat meat. Do you like mm-hmm. spicy food or bland food? Do you like gourmet cooking? Do you like fast food restaurants? You know, so. But definitely, I try to find out a little bit about who I'm cooking for. If it's a meat eater that I'm trying to, um, you know, help people. Awesome. I that skillet lasagna right now. Perfect. And um, we had a non-vegan yeah. ask, um, what food can be easily made solely with a microwave? I don't have a stove slash oven. This could be good because we have a lot of, uh, like, students here, a lot of college students, oh, yeah. people going into dorm living. And I know... I lived in a dorm vegan. It was terrible. I ate way too much peanut butter and jelly. So <laughs> do you have any advice on maybe what you can cook with just a microwave or? Yeah, oh, mug cakes. Just, just eat nothing <laughs> but mug cakes. I, have, I, I will sometimes have a mug cake every single day. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally just a little cake for one, and you put it in a coffee mug, some flour, and it can be gluten-free, some flour, a little bit of baking soda, baking powder, some cocoa mm-hmm. powder. You know, there's a million different recipes. You add a little bit of plant milk and you microwave it for a minute and you have a perfect cake. But obviously you can't live on cake. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, baked potatoes. You can do a bake, you can take a raw potato and you put it in a towel and you bake uh-huh. it for I mean you microwave it, sorry, for about four minutes. And depending on the size. You have to put water in the tile, right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of water. Um, and, and, you know, potatoes, one, they're so filling and satiating, but then you can mm-hmm. top it with chili or lentil soup that you eat in the microwave. Mm. That's an easy one. Um, That's good. Uh, yeah, I'm blanking. But yeah, and sweet potatoes, the same as potatoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a, you know, pita a million years ago, but it's so good. They did a college cookbook. Let me find the link and post it. Yes. We, uh, we handed them out. I have, I have a vegan club on my campus, and uh, we, we used to hand those out. <laughs> and that was all about, yeah, the microwave. So, yeah, there's some, there's some good resources out there. Perfect. You can cook broccoli, uh, broccoli you know, in a microwave. Not that that's exciting, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, if you, I think if you get some spices... That's good. It just makes like everything better. Like, I mean, you could just yeah. have some garlic or chili powder, and then, you know, <laughs> frozen vegetables, spice it up. Yep. Be- yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Oh, and, and you can do a lot of the. Um, you know, if you if you're doing the the chicken fingers, the vegan chicken, you know, the things that are crispy and breaded, those don't come out so well in the microwave. But seitan, tofurkey sausages, um, mm-hmm. you know, the shredded chicken, things like that, those can be great in a microwave. Awesome. Uh, um, cup of soups. Mm-hmm. Soups. Great. All right. Um, so how concerned should vegans be about calcium? For Jack, what are good ways to ensure you're getting enough calcium? For Alex. Uh, vegans should be making sure they get enough calcium, and that, I would say at least 700 milligrams per day, which is the mm-hmm. British RDA. And so that means getting probably more calcium than you would get if you just randomly ate vegan foods, even healthy vegan foods. You can get it. Um, I'll cover some of this, Alex, so that 
Yes, please. Kind of mm -hmm. my wheelhouse. Um, so there are certain greens that are high in calcium and that are the calcium is well absorbed, and those would be. Let's see. There is a uh, on veganhealth.org. There is a, an article called Daily Needs. Let me send it into the chat, and that's where you can find out what vegans need to pay attention to and how to get it. So that that covers everything. Post it now. All right. And in terms of calcium, there are specific dark leafy green vegetables, which are turnip greens, mustard greens, kale, bok choy, and collard greens. Mm, collard there's greens. also calcium fortified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also calcium fortified beverages, mm. such as non dairy milks or orange juice. There's tofu is made often made typically made with calcium salts. I don't think silicon is. But firm tofu generally is. And mm -hmm. because it's made with calcium salts, there's a lot of calcium in, in the tofu. So that's another good source of calcium. And if you don't do any of those things, you really should take a calcium supplement of three to 500 okay. milligrams per day. But it's better if you get it from the food. Okay, cool, cool. Sounds great. Um, all right, so... As a new vegan with autism, I feel very overwhelmed with meal planning and recipes. Is there any tips you can give people like me who just want a quick whole food meals? Who just want oh. quick whole food meals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, let me back up real quick. I have a tip for the dark leafy greens. If mm -hmm. you don't naturally love the flavor of collard greens and, and turnip greens, add a little bit of balsamic vinegar when you're cooking. Um, just like a, a teaspoon, maybe a tablespoon if it's two big bunches. It helps tenderize the greens, and it also helps kind of soften the flavor and add some umami if you, you know, don't love them as they are. So, so one of the easiest things to do when you first go vegan is keep eating what you were eating. Just veganize it. So if you have oatmeal every morning with cow milk before, just start having oatmeal every morning with soy milk. And, okay. you know, a hummus sandwich for lunch. Uh, or a turkey sandwich for lunch can become a tofurkey sandwich for lunch or a hummus sandwich for lunch. If you love spaghetti every single night, keep having spaghetti. Just have the, either vegan meatballs instead of meat or add beans instead of ground meat. Um, you know, because pasta and chickpeas and tomato sauce, that's a really healthy meal. You've got, mm -hmm. you know, good carbs, good um, umami flavor, the protein from the chickpeas. It can just be a can of chickpeas you just open and toss in and then some sort of you can either add frozen broccoli or frozen veg right to the spaghetti or have a salad on the right. side. Um, so it's very easy and, and very healthy. You know, healthy vegan food does not have to be complex and raw and sprouted right, and juiced. Right. And, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, you just want to make sure you get some protein. So beans, lentils, vegan meat, whatever works best for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some veggies and fruit. And try to mimic what you're already doing. And... Do it one at a time. So you might first just want to ease into vegan breakfast, but don't do, don't change your lunch or dinner yet. Or mm -hmm. maybe you just do one dish, you know, again, back to the, the spaghetti or, or taco night. You know, if you always have taco Tuesdays, then the first thing you should do is get really good at vegan tacos. And then when you've got that down, you, you know, veganize the next one. Most of us only eat seven to 11 meals over and over. And we think we don't, but when we oh, have yeah. To, yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it can be, it just go for those first. Don't try new things right away. Gotcha. Sounds great. Um, all right. So can we talk a bit about heme iron versus non heme iron, which is necessary to get through the diet? What is the difference there? Um, why do carnivores like to bring it up? <laughs> <laughs> They like to bring it up because heme iron is absorbed at a much higher rate than non-heme iron, and you only find non-heme iron in plant foods except for the Impossible Burger, which has synthesized heme iron and, and, now, and contains heme iron. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if you uh, add vitamin C to meals, vitamin C combines with iron to create a, a compound molecule that is absorbed a lot easier than iron without the ascorbic acid. Did I say vitamin C is ascorbic acid? So okay. if you if you eat vitamin C at meals, and I recommend doing that for anyone who tends to have low iron stores or has been anemic in the past, 
Uh, for most people, especially men, because we don't lose iron through menstruating, there's nothing to really worry about unless you think that you might have a problem with anemia, in which case I would recommend getting yourself tested by a doctor because iron panels are very common and inexpensive. Usually insurance will cover them. And mm -hmm. then you can find out for sure because generally self-diagnosing yourself with, with vitamin deficiencies is, is usually not, not accurate. Great. And yeah. so because sometimes there's not much you can do about it. But with, with iron, you can because it's so common to test for iron. Mm -hmm. So I would first do that. If you are, if you are um, not male, then you probably, you'll be at a higher risk for iron deficiency. And so I would recommend eating or drinking a source of vitamin C with a, one to two meals a day. And I do that myself, even though I've been tested for iron deficiency and I've never had it. Uh, just because I wanted to see what whether I did or not, just because I was curious. I've been tested numerous times for it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's, you know, just I eat an orange with dinner, and sometimes uh, sometimes I take a vitamin C tablet with just because I have them around with breakfast for iron absorption. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that's that's – you got to make sure you're getting enough vitamin C. A, a glass, a half a cup of orange juice or a full orange has a decent amount of vitamin C. Sprinkling lemon on food doesn't. There's just not enough vitamin C there to make a difference. And we oh. have we have the sources of vitamin C in our iron section on the the link I just posted, so you can see what is truly a good source of vitamin C and what isn't. That's the, the most effective way to increase your iron stores unless you are diagnosed with iron deficiency, in which case they will put you on iron treatment where you're taking mm -hmm. large doses of iron for a number of weeks to get your stores back up. Uh, that's eating greens. Uh -huh. Greens are higher. In, you want to eat some foods that are higher in iron as well. Vegans tend to have diets that are high in non-heme iron mm -hmm. uh, and high in iron in general, like total iron. Vegans usually have the highest iron intakes. So it's not that like we're not getting iron. Mm. And iron absorption, as iron stores go down, iron uh, absorption increases. So your body tends to, most people's bodies tend to make up for the low iron. But sometimes, especially if you're, say, a female endurance runner of, uh, who's menstruating, uh, running is very damaging to blood cells because of the, the foot strike. And mm -hmm. they are probably at the highest risk for iron deficiency if they're especially if they're not paying attention to it, uh, of anyone. That's a, and we have a I have a long article on iron <laughs> that I actually it's a concise article on iron on veganhealth.org if you want more details about iron. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, all right, so this question is: so I have diagnosed IBS. I can't handle too much fiber. What low fiber, high protein foods could you recommend? I guess that's for either. <laughs> Well, tofu is, is low in fiber and high in, in, mm -hmm. in protein. I don't know how much fiber is in seitan. I'm guessing that it's fairly low, it's, relatively it's, speaking. I mean, a serving, I think, yeah, is like ahead. point. I, I just I looked up seitan earlier, and I think it's a serving is 0.2% of your, uh, or 2% of your daily value. Um, so I think that's that'd be considered similar. low in fiber. Yeah. So um, yeah, tofu, seitan, that's great. Yeah, Any, so a lot of the vegan meats are low. Mm -hmm. You could. Uh, Protein drinks, mm. so get protein drinks protein with a lot of fiber. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean that, that's there's you know there's not a whole lot of foods that grow in nature that are vegan that are low in fiber right. and high right. in protein. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, makes hey, sense. Jack, didn't you once recommend ripple milks? As uh, because some ripples fortified with protein. Oh, the pea protein milk, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's the lower fiber and, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think awesome. soy milk generally doesn't have a lot of fiber. I don't believe so. There's this one, um, I think Silk is the brand, but it's like an extra protein soy uh -huh. milk that like, just came out. It's like yeah. 20 grams of protein for like a 200 calorie glass. It's amazing. <laughs> it's it's yeah. up the protein shake game a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. 
Tofurkey sausages are low in, are, are relatively low in calories for how much protein they have, and I'm mm-hmm. guessing they're relatively low in, in fiber as well. But they they tend to be less than 300 calories and uh, I think 19 or 20 grams of fiber in a sausage, mm-hmm. depending on which one it is. They different brands have slightly different amounts. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, Not um, brands, but flavors. So this one is for Alex. Can you give some tips for an ideal, fantastic, gourmet, fine dining dish? It could be recipes, links, whatever. Just what do you, what do you go for? Uh, it's so hard because there's so many fun cookbooks. <laughs> but, so again, I did post the link and I will post it again. But that skillet lasagna mm-hmm. has just this incredible umami. It's rich. It's satisfying. It tends to just blow people away, whether they're vegan or not. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. If you, depending on where you live and what, what vegan food you have access to, like in New York City and the Bay Area and California, there's some incredible artisan vegan cheeses. So you could start off with a vegan cheese plate um, mm-hmm. and like a, almost like a, char- a charcuterie. I would not do that with just the mainstream vegan cheeses that the rest of us can get. They're great for pizza or whatever, but not as a, as a cheese mm-hmm. board. Um, and then I would do, oh my gosh, probably roast, depending again on the time of, uh, the time of year and what's in season. So if it's fall or winter, I would do some sort of like roast uh, apples or pears for dessert with, with ginger. And let me say, see that link for you. Um, yes, I know where it is. I'll find it in a second. Um, and chocolate. I always want to make sure to have something chocolate for dessert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, and there's a vegan Spanakopita. I used to always make at the restaurant that was so good. So the, you know, the Spanac- filo dough was just crispy and delicious and all those delicate layers. And then that rich savory filling with the, the fresh dill and spinach. Mm, oh, that's awesome. I, I in my uh, I have a cookbook that has a spanakopa. I've never had spanakopa in my life, but every time I'm flipping through it, that always catches my eye. So I think yeah. I gotta try that. Yeah. <laughs> Anything with phyllo dough, you're gonna love, right? It's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um. So it's been an hour. That was the um, time we had selected for the event. Um. Wanted to thank you all so so much for coming. This was a fantastic event. Uh, you all are incredibly knowledgeable and very friendly. Um, <laughs> and I think everyone had a really great time. We got a lot of questions answered. Um, so I wanted to ask you last thing is, uh, would you be willing to let us transcribe the audio recording from this so that we can add it to a bot on the server uh, with links to the recording and your website as a way to quickly cite answers to uh, a lot of the topics you've answered? Um, like calcium, iron, and stuff? Sure. Cut out all the ums and so's for me, please. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we will, we'll, we'll cut those out. <laughs> yeah, if you can make me sound more intelligent, absolutely, you have my permission. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right, this is an amazing help to us. Um, this is definitely going to be super helpful to a ton of non-vegans. Um, and it was really helpful to everyone. I've got some cooking advice. I got to figure out what I need from the store to make this lasagna and get after that. So, <laughs> but uh, did you all want to yeah, say anything, great. promote anything? Yeah. Promote please. donating. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that you should check out our 10 weeks to vegan series. If you're interested in learning more about how to go vegan, which is mm-hmm. at veganoutreach.org. Click on, uh, I think in the upper left, there's a, uh, uh, I should know this by heart, but I don't remember what it says actually to click well, on. It doesn't say 10 weeks to vegan. Yeah. <laughs> it, oh, Gosh. it says try vegan. So on veganoutreach.org, click try vegan. Then mm-hmm. it will say 10 weeks to vegan. And oh. we have, we're in 45 or 47 countries. So wow. uh, in many different, in the, the language of the, the main language of the country. Um, so we have a lot of uh, options there. And, um, yeah, this was great, and, and thanks a lot. And anytime you have more questions, of I'd course. To, yeah, we uh, would love to. We would love to have you all back. Uh, this is a really, really fun event. Um, well, great. yeah. So thank you all uh, so much. You can, uh, I guess, click exit the stage at the bottom right. Um, 
And again, okay. thank you so much uh, for helping the animals yeah, and giving you. us some knowledge. All right. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later. My pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you. It's really fun. No problem. Bye, Alex. Bye. All right. I guess I don't know how to end. I guess I'm just going to leave too. All right. <laughs> well, uh, bye, everyone. Thanks for showing up to the event.